Hello everyone, I'm up for nomination for Best British Podcast, so if you could kindly take a minute and click the link in my bio and type in James English and place your vote, it'd be very much appreciated. Thank you. Can you make sure you click the subscribe button for my channel and the notifications button so you will be updated when my next podcast goes out? You can also follow me on social media. My Facebook page is James English 11. My Twitter is James English 0. My Instagram is James English 2. And you can also download these podcasts on Podbean and iTunes. And we're on. Today's guest, we've got the legend Dan Penna. First of all, Dan, I just want to say thank you for letting us into your castle. My pleasure. How's things today? Great. It's terrific. As you were just commenting before we got on camera, it's a lovely day in Scotland. Uh-huh. First for everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I've watched a lot of your videos, seen your stuff with Joe Rogan. Very powerful man. And you're still hustling. You're still working hard. Mm-hmm. You're still constantly trying to progress and educate others. I always like to go back to the start with my guests, where they grew up and how they get involved in the life they're involved in now. So where was it you grew up? I'm from East Los Angeles. Um, I was born at the end of World War II in uh, Florida on a naval base. My dad was in the Naval Air Force. We moved to uh, East Los Angeles where he was from and where my mother was from. And so I was in the barrio. And so I uh, got in a lot of trouble. Uh, the... Uh, Uh, Tried to kill my teacher when I was in fifth, sixth grade. uh, Expelled from uh, school three times and finally expelled from the school district. They wouldn't even take me in the district. They said, you got to move. And uh, um, and so my mother uh, uh, nagged my father into buying a house we couldn't afford uh, in an area that was considered um, safer. But I found bad shit to do there. I mean, you know. Try to burn the school down, amongst other things. <laughs> How'd you do? Yeah, well, no, I wasn't very successful. I'm not a good arson. <laughs> yeah, so that was one thing I ticked off not to try as I, when I grew up. Uh, and, the, um, the, uh, and I volunteered uh, for the draft in 1966 at the height of the Vietnam conflict. And, the, um, and I went off, and the military made, made, made a man out of me. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be picked to go to uh, officer school. And I spent six months there and I came out. And so I was a young 21-year-old second lieutenant. And the, and the world really changed for me. And that was the first high-performance thing I had ever done uh, where I was a commissioned officer. And in American service and in, here at the, in Britain, you're considered an officer and a gentleman. Now, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but a gentleman was not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I really took it seriously. And the, um, when, I, when I got out of the military, uh, I decided, uh, not that college education is a necessity, I decided to go back to university. I had flunked out three times before I left. I had been arrested five times, been in jail. Uh, the, um, but I came back, graduated. And then I, I, I went to Wall Street, where the action was in, the, in, in those days, which was the early 70s. And uh, the rest is more or less history. I found it... Um, invigorating, challenging every day. I used to work four or five days straight without going back to my apartment on, in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, I'm not too different now. You had commented at the beginning of the interview how I'm, uh, I'm still after it uh, at my age. And I don't know any different. I still work 50, 60 hours a week, uh, but I don't consider it work because I love what I do. But back in those days, when I was your age, I worked 100, 120 hours a week. I worked 12, 15, 18 hours a day. I slept on the floor of my office, uh, or I slept on my desk. And, the, um, but, uh, the, uh, and then um, I, I founded a, a company uh, with 800 bucks, which is about nothing. Uh, and I floated it here on the London Stock Exchange. Um, and uh, I turned, so I turned 820 bucks into 450 million bucks about 35 years ago. And today's dollars, it'd be a, about a billion dollars. And that's pre-internet money. That's um, bricks and mortar. And uh, the, um, I got thrown out of uh, the company I founded uh, by the shareholders because I wasn't the right kind of guy to be uh, CEO of a public company. Uh, I owned 60% of the stock, so I didn't really give a fuck what the shareholders said. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> so you were in control. Yeah, I was in control. And as soon as I lost control, I was out. 
How can you lose control? Oh, well, because I sold stock off. You know, I bought places like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to have five big estates. And so, you know, I sold shares off at the appropriate time. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I went down below 50%. And uh, as soon as I uh, went down uh, below 50%, the shareholders ousted me. And the, uh, that was about 27 years ago. And about 26 years ago, I, I uh, trying to figure, what the fuck am I going to do, you know? Uh -huh. I was still relatively young. I was in my late 40s. And uh, I decided, well, um, I'll coach. I'll see what I can show these kids how I did it. A kid from a bad neighborhood, got in trouble, went to jail, uh, expelled from school, all these bad things, flunked, uh, you know, uh, flunked out of university. Uh, and uh, I've been doing it uh, ever since. And when I started in um, uh, May of 1993, I said um, I didn't like the idea of personal development because personal development is... Is not what I do. I wanted to change the way uh, financial coaching was and where we actually were accountable. How much money did I get you to create from scratch? How much money did I get him to create from scratch? And uh, so we set up a lot of very hard, stringent benchmarks. And 25 years later, I'm an overnight success after 25 years, mm. we created way in excess of $50 billion with meatheads just like you, mm. you know? Uh, just, you know, uh, whether you have no education or a lot of education. And um, the system is uh, renowned now. Uh, we have the processes, the systems, the procedures that allow somebody with no education, nay money, uh, to go out and create wealth. But I think yeah. that's a good thing to, for people watching that anybody can make anything in their life, no Correct. matter how fucked up your past is, no matter how old you are, because you haven't had it handed to you. Correct. People might look from the outside and think, He's probably had the silver spoon. He's probably had it all easy. But it's not the hustle, the 120 hours a, a week, the the constant sleep on the fucking floor, the office, and making it work. Correct. And then people, there's too many soft people in this generation. You can't even fucking say a joke anymore without people getting offended. Correct. So I think the hustle and the grind, it doesn't come easy. You've got to have the vision, but you've got to work your fucking ass off to get to where you want to belong. Where did the, When you started all your... You're re being a rebel and basically causing havoc. Where did that come from? Well, uh, it came from, uh, you had to be tough where I was raised. The, the, there was no soft people. Uh, everybody was a hard ass. And if you weren't a hard ass, you got the shit thumped out of you every day. Uh, but the, the rebel part, I've always had high self-esteem. I didn't realize growing up that most people don't have self-esteem. I thought everybody did because my little group were my alpha male father had a lot of self-esteem. He was a war hero from the Second World War and the Korean War. And uh, the, uh, he had a lot of self-esteem. And the guys that he was around had a lot of self-esteem. And so I took advantage of that self-esteem. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was in, in, in a legitimate way. When one guy has self-esteem and 15 don't, it's very easy for that one guy to control the 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, I utilized that in the financial world. And in, I, I've been utilizing that. And now I teach the kids how to build self-esteem. Uh, low self-esteem isn't a permanent thing. It's like drug, a drug habit. You can get rid of it. It's not, it's not easy. In fact, it's very, very difficult to get rid of it, but you can. And so the, uh, but self-esteem is, is, is the basis of all high performance. And when you look around people like Job, like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, they all have, have, have a lot of self-esteem. But what they also have, 98% of the people that are watching this, listening to this, uh, fall into one category. They're not alpha males, okay? They're beta males or beta gals. 98% uh, of the high-performance people in the world are not loudmouth fucks like you and me, okay? They're introverts. And Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett uh, are, have one thing in common. They're introverts. They're introverts that are super smart, and they're introverts that work 100, 120 hours uh, a week. Look at Warren Buffett. He's 88 years old, I believe. He still works... 70, 80 hours a week at 88. He hasn't had to work in 40 years, 50 years. I haven't had to work in 35 years. Uh, some of the kids, uh, when I spoke at the University of Edinburgh uh, about a year ago uh, to their uh, business school, the, um, a couple of the guys uh, and gals asked me, how do you get up in the morning when you haven't had to work in 35 years? How do you structure your day? Well, I don't think about the fact that I haven't had to work in 35 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, all I know is I continue to reset my goals, reset my goals higher and higher. I continue to make the benchmarks higher and higher, and I make myself accountable. 
nobody can make you accountable better than you. And uh, the um, and so I, I just continue to drive myself. Yeah, I think that's the best way. And people asking those questions, that's a weak mentality. Why do you need to do this and why do you need to do that? It doesn't matter how much money you have, whether it's a billion, 50 billion, 10 million. Everything's about progression. You're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to be happy with what you're achieving until you achieve more. For me personally, it's to set goals. When I set those goals and achieve those goals, that's when I get my buzz. That buzz only lasts for two, three hours and then it goes and then I need to jump on something else to create something else or create vision. Do you think all your, your boisterous stuff when you were younger and your anger and frustration, did, when did you channel that into changing your life and creating well, a business? Well, I, I, I channeled it when I saw how different I was. I channeled it that uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, okay? The, the, the medium mouth that sits in the corner reading a book it doesn't get much attention, okay? The wall, wallflower girl, Lassie, doesn't get much attention. The, uh, the, uh, and so I learned that uh, the, the more I open my mouth, I've refined my, 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 um, my ability to talk and speak over the years. When I was a young guy, I, you know, I was just pushy, obnoxious. Now they call me, uh, I'm uh, not pushy, obnoxious. I'm still pushy, but not obnoxious. It's hard to call somebody uh, with as much money as I have obnoxious. Mm -hmm. So they just say I'm pushy. But uh, I, I, don't, I almost will never take no for an answer. I don't care. My, 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 my re reply to you, if you say no to me, that's something I've requested. How can I make it so it's a yes? What can I change about the proposal? What about the structure? Uh, and uh, the, I, I normally turn half of the no's into yeses because normally it's something you said, you did. It's not like uh, the um, uh, Glasgow football, the Rangers versus the uh, Celtics. Celtics. It's, it's not that kind of thing. It's not ingrained that they were raised to say no to you, okay? Um, the, uh, they said no based on you didn't tick one of the boxes. And so when you learn to push the right buttons, as my Yorkshire wife would say, <laughs> uh, to push the right buttons, uh, you know how to narrow it down to, uh, to turn some of those no's into yeses. And the, um, uh, and the you know, as I said before we got uh, on air, when I came to Scotland, it was 5 million people 35 years ago. Today, as we sit here for this podcast, there's 5 million people, okay? There's a reason for that. Uh, and the, uh, whereas the rest of the economies are, have, have grown uh, so rapidly, uh, it's because uh, Scotland is, when I moved here, they said, um, you know, we're in the 40s, here, 40s. So I said, well, 1940s and not 1980s, no, no, Dan, we're in the 1840s, not the 1940s. There's still things here. My neighbor across the street has been here 200 years, his family. The other families around here look down upon him because he's only been here 200 years. And they've been here 500 years. 600 years, 700 years. This castle celebrated its 550th anniversary last year. 550 years, the Guthrie's. Uh, yeah, I read about the Guthrie clan. Yeah. And um, the contacts and the William Wallace stuff, and it's got some amount of yeah. history behind it. Uh, the uh, Willie Wallace in uh, 1296 sailed from um, our growth to Calais to pick up Willie Wallace and bring him back here uh, to uh, fight the English. And in 1468, James III of Scotland gave Guthrie, Sir John Guthrie, um, 500,000 hectares, which is about a, a million acres, uh, for some great thing that he did during fighting the English. I mean, he killed a lot of English is basically what he did. <laughs> and so, but uh, the, the Guthrie estate used to be from here up to Aberdeen. Chunks of Scotland from here to Aberdeen were Guthrie. Mm -hmm. And the um, and this when I bought it in '84, this was the last bastion of the Guthrie clan, and um, uh, Ivan the Terrible, Colonel Ivan Guthrie, had just passed away, and so when I bought it, they were going to turn this into timeshares, and the um, and so I more or less saved it, and uh, it's uh, we we live in all the rooms, all the 55,000 square feet, and uh, subsequently about 20 years ago, I built a golf course. And oh, we have our own private golf course here. And uh, the, um, but uh, to, to our kids, our daughter was raised here, or born here, I should say, in Dundee. And our two sons were raised here. They look, uh, uh, they used to have real, real thick 
accents. But they've lived in America now for a long, long time, and they've lost those accents. Mm -hmm. But when our, our youngest son's named Derek Stewart. Scottish, Pena. pure Scottish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, you could cut his accent with a chainsaw. Uh -huh. Yeah. How do you, can you understand the language okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, when I get up in the Shetlands and places, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure anybody can understand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking earlier and you said you were in Govan trying yeah. to get your passport. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, that's a rough-ass part of town. <laughs> that's rough as fuck. That is, it's really rough. It's it's funny to hear um, such a wealthy man and a successful business man as yourself to be speaking about Govan because yeah. as, there's a, a lot of poverty in Glasgow. There's a lot of tough areas. It's a fucking tough city. It's really tough. It's But again... You can get stuck in that, you can be a product of your environment and get stuck in that routine where the drink and the violence becomes your life and you don't see a way out. It's very difficult. I don't know many people who has changed their life and changed their mindset and changed their belief system to go, do you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to change. I'm going to change everything about my life. It's difficult though because the patterns that we do on a daily basis repeat itself. So to break the patterns, it becomes uncomfortable for people. That's why they go back. And they sit in their life of fucking misery because it's easier for them. It's what they know. For the people who are watching, who want advice, how to change or how to be ruthless, because you're ruthless. I watch your videos and the way you speak, for a Glasgow guy, it's funny because that's we, we swear a lot. But people can be put off and, and pushed to go, fuck, he's crazy. But I believe we're all crazy. I think people just hide it better than others. What advice would you give for people to maybe jump on it? Okay, create okay. A business there, or do there, well? there's three benchmarks, one of which we can't do anything about, which I'll talk about first. The first seven or eight years of life is self-esteem is built. Who are you around the first seven or eight years? Your mom, maybe a dad, an older brother or sister, right? And maybe a grandparent. You can't do anything. You can't do anything about those, mm -hmm. okay? And what do those three or four or five people know about building self-esteem or building a high-performance person? Nothing. Fuck all. Okay. <laughs> now, you're, you're now 15 years old. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You're the average of the five to seven people that you hang with, chill with, your mates you go out to the fucking pub with, okay? Most of the people that are listening to this, those mates are fucking bums, okay? <laughs> they don't deserve to be alive. They should have rolled down the inside of their mama's leg. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> so the easiest way to change, and I had a, a criminal, a uh, very well-known criminal, which I won't say his name. Not the one you interviewed, another one, though. Okay. I'll get him on the show next time. <laughs> okay. okay. And he was here in the late 90s, and, he, um, uh, and I told him the easiest way. In those days, we had block phones that looked like this, cell phones that looked like this, you know, block, bricks. And I, I told him, I said, when you go back uh, to London, uh, change the phone number and say in the message, if you don't have my uh, phone number, Fuck off, you're out of my life. A year or two later, I, I bump into him in London at a, at a restaurant, and I said, how does it go? And he says, it's going terrific. And that idea you about changing the phone number was great until my mother got the message, okay? <laughs> and I mean, uh, the, most of the people, uh, the, the, we attract people, you know, the, the law of self-attraction is, you know, they're talking about positive attraction, but it also works in a negative way. Most of the people that we are uh, associating with remind us of ourselves. They don't remind us of some yeah. world-class Olympian, or they don't remind us of, you know, um, uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie, who just comes from down the road here, yeah, yeah. arguably the richest guy who ever America. lived. Yeah, uh, and uh, he left, uh, mm -hmm. depending on which story you want to believe, either between seven and 12 years old, um, but uh, they leave that environment. And so, but it's very difficult for you to close down Facebook, Take all the phone numbers in your, well, they don't call them Rolodex anymore, but whatever your, yeah. your iPad or whatever it is, uh, and sw switch them out. And one of the things, and the kids that are the most successful, and the reason why I'm more successful uh, in many regards with young kids, they don't have as much negative baggage. Uh, you know, uh, my current uh, phenom, who's not a teenager anymore, he's 21, uh, Josh Kim, uh, you know, uh, didn't have a lot of negative baggage because he was only 17 years old uh, when he came here. Uh, the guys that are 45, 50, 55 have been through a lot of shite, and it's difficult for them. First of all, they've got mortgages to pay, car payments, perhaps uh, school payments, uh, school for their kids to go into, if they go to a private school. Uh, they've got uh, to support a mom, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe a drunken dad, uh, a drug addict brother, okay? It's very difficult. I'm not suggesting they do that. 
Just cut them all off. Of course, but that's what, but it is a very lonely journey. People are too, people don't know how to be themselves. There's no creativity, there's no individuality. And like you says there, the people who you surround yourself with the people you become. It's a reflection image. If you're fucked up in the head, a lot of relationships, a lot of my ex-girlfriends were fucking crazy. The reason being because I was crazy. I was fucked up. I didn't know who I was. So you, you attract, I believe everything's frequencies. I believe you attract who you are. Like attracts like as well. And it's difficult because to change your life and to be successful, it's fucking lonely. It's lonely. And I'm, I've experienced this the last year and I don't speak to people, but then people think I'm getting become above my station where I don't care about them or you don't he forgets where he's came from. I'm not. I'm just wanting a better life for me and my kids. Did you ever experience that yourself? Oh, it was fuck yes. Lonely as fuck. The, the um, eagles fly alone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, eagles fly above the clouds. All the other dipshit birds fly in the clouds. Okay. <laughs> Pigeons. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so, but eagles fly alone. Uh, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, uh, those kind of people don't hang. They don't chill. They don't go to the World Cup. They, 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 they don't go to the, uh, uh, the uh, World Basketball Championships. They don't go to the Masters. They don't go to the Open Championship. They don't go any fucking place. Mm -hmm. All they do is work. And uh, the, uh, uh, the only friend uh, possibly that um, uh, uh, Bill Gates has is Warren Buffett, his mentor. Mm -hmm. Okay? The, um, and th I understand I've got three guys. I used to have five guys. Two are dead now. I have three guys that I've known since I was a boy. We were all poor and uh, we're all successful. I'm the most successful. Uh, we see each other once or twice a year. We have a dinner. Uh, we talk about the old times. Uh, and then I'll, I'll see you next year. That's it. I'm the only one of the three that drinks. <laughs> Fuck seeing you and I drink yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the only one that drinks. And, 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 uh, the, uh, and they all tell the story, which is a true story. I'm 17 years old. And my dad's a cop, remember, okay. My dad went to some police convention, LAPD, and he wasn't supposed to be back till the Monday. So on the Sunday, we had a party at my house, and uh, the, um, I drank so much that they thought I, uh, I was dead. They pronounced me dead, okay. <laughs> About the same time that 999 guys are pronouncing me dead, my dad rolls up a day early, okay. Uh, and uh, everybody scatters because my dad was a badass. And uh, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the saying that uh, we're afraid that you came just at the wrong time, sir, uh, uh, your son's away. He kicks me in the fucking ribs. I sit up. <laughs> he says, I know the lazy fucking, f yeah, get up, uh, get to your room. I'll deal with you later. Mm -hmm. yeah, he didn't give a shit. I almost died. All I know <laughs> is that we had trashed the house, drank all the alcohol that was in the house. Uh, and the uh, and he was embarrassed. The neighbors. He went around and apologized to all the neighbors, because when you fuck something up in, in, in a bad neighborhood, they look down upon. They said, "I apologize. I apologize. I'm going to take care of Danny. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of him." And when my dad was extremely hard on me, uh, and uh, when his brother and sister, older brother and sister, said, "You know, you're really rough on Danny," because uh, he used to beat me like I mean, physically beat me like a rented mule, and he turned to his sister and said, "Well, how's your program working out with your crack whore daughter?" And he turned to his brother and said, how's your program working out with your San Quentin, that's a prison, San Quentin ridden son? Mm -hmm. You leave me running my family. And of course, then, you know, uh, I was, the other of my relatives weren't successful. I have a cousin who went to jail for stabbing a guy 17 times for saying his girlfriend had a big ass. Stabbed him 17 times. <laughs> By the grace of God, he didn't know how to stab because the guy didn't die. <laughs> you know? Do you think that helped you, though? Oh, yeah. Your I dad that. beating the shit out of you to, oh, yeah. to become ruthless. Uh, absolutely, yeah. My dad believed children are seen and not heard. Seen. And when I, my dad told me to stand right there, short of a tsunami, knocking me down, I didn't move. Mm -hmm. One day, three days, four months, I didn't move because he beat the fuck out of me. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get help or did you ever go to like a psychologist or anything or did you just deal with it yourself? I just dealt with it. Just fucking basically take the reins? Well, it, it, back in the 50s and early in the 60s, uh, psychologists were for cunts. <laughs> That's true. They're up the ass with the money they make. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and they just sit there and listen to all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And what else? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, no, we didn't, we didn't uh, seek any therapy um, and... Uh, but I mean, I am, I am crazy. There's no question about it. Everybody's man. crazy. Yeah. I think people hide it better than others. A lot of people are in denial. San Quentin, who was a, who was a guy? Was it Johnny Cash? Song about the song, San yeah, Quentin? Yeah, correct. 
Yeah. He sang it there. Yeah. He went yeah, there. he went to the prison and sang yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. He was another fucking nutcase. Yeah. I think all your success, I think you've got to be psychotic to get to a certain level, especially that you're at. You've got to be ruthless, cutthroat, to be what the workload. And you have to be selfish. Yeah. No, you, you can't love anybody else. You can't be a good father, good uh, son, good uh, whatever, unless you love yourself first. You take care of yourself first, mm -hmm. uh, both physically and mentally, then you can take care of other yeah. people. Love is within, and it's cheesy. And people go, oh, fucking shut up. But love is within. If you love yourself, then everything else that comes into your life, I believe, becomes a bonus. The way you were raised, how did you then raise your kids? Was it more stability? It was tough, tough love. Yeah. Tough love. Uh -huh. uh, the, uh, my dad, I believe, invented tough love in the 50s. And he probably didn't. But, I mean, the tough love. I was hard. And, the, um, uh, and especially uh, now, uh, we have kids that come to the seminar here that have never been in a schoolyard fight have never been uh, disciplined by their parents, uh, I mean spanked or hit, never uh, yelled at by their parents, uh, never, uh, they wouldn't say shit if it was in their mouth, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I come, I come up with the phrase snowflake, because they melt under pressure, <laughs> you know? Okay, uh, we have a snowflake test. If uh, somebody uh, spit in your mother's face, you have four alternatives. Mm -hmm. The most used alternative on that test as God is my witness, I would try to ascertain what kind of day he was having. The guy that spit in your mom's face. Instead of picking up a fucking pipe <laughs> and leaving his brains on the fucking sidewalk. That's true. In my neighborhood, the spit wouldn't have even hit their mom's mm. face before the guy would be on him. But do you think these people can e try and educate themselves too much without actually fucking living? Private schools and... Raised with the silver spoon and reading all these books and go to all these cinema se uh, se seminars. How can you live? It's trial and error. I think you've got to make mistake after okay. mistake after mistake so you can learn. Like your says, if you get a no, even though you're asking what did I do wrong or how can I get a yes, that's giving you improvement, what you can work on for your next interview. Correct. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the um, kids have been uh, convinced wrongly, in my opinion, that reading books and listening to podcasts and, and, and uh, researching stuff on the internet is taking action. That's not taking action. Fucking pulling the trigger and doing it trial and error just as you alluded to a minute ago. It's trial and error. Most of the stuff I, I know is because I've been involved uh, in, uh, in every kind of uh, happening possible. Um, I, when I spoke at Oxford a couple years ago, one of the guys in the front row said, do you realize that I've, uh, uh, I've read 700 books on personal development? And I commented, well, I didn't know there was 700 books on personal development. Mm -hmm. Then a guy that was sitting two, two spaces over said, uh, who would you rather have? Somebody that is uh, advising you, uh, counseling you, mentoring you, a person that has read 700 books, or a person that has done 700 transactions? Well, I've done many more than 700 transactions, but I mean, I want the person that's got some gray hair, bald head, wrinkles, that has lived life advising me, not some guy that's some academic that has read 700 books. Did you kill a bear? Yes. How's that story? How the fuck did you kill a bear? Did it not kill you, try and kill you? Of course it did. It was like going to a, a, a ranger, uh, you know, uh, football. Yeah. yeah, I mean, same thing. You're a Celtic, you know? Uh -huh. um, the, uh, uh, I haven't killed anything since 1991, but around 1990, uh, I went from hunting with a rifle, which I'm a really, not a world-class shot, but almost world-class shot, to hunting with a uh, big handgun, and you got to get pretty close for a handgun, to han uh, hunting with a big knife, okay. Uh, and so I, I wanted a, a, a Kodiak bear to my collection. I have a trophy room here. Uh, Is that here? The, yeah, at that end of the castle. And, the, uh, and so uh, we, uh, I slowed down the bear with a handgun. At that time, the largest handgun on the planet was called a 454 Council. And the bullets, each bullet was about as big as your thumb, like this. And uh, so I hit the bear uh, three, four times and, and slowed it down. It wasn't dead yet. And then I jumped on it with uh, a knife. Uh, and uh, I don't really have any recollection because the adrenaline was pumping so hard. I have no recollection of, other than when it was dead and I was sitting on top of it. That's the next thing I remember. But the, the hunter that I was with, the guide, said that my arm was going up so fast, it blurred like a piston. Uh -huh. Because I was going, 
<laughs> like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, the um, and so I did, and it's it's in the trophy room. It's sitting in there, seven feet tall. Fuck's uh, sake. The uh, but uh, then um, about that same time frame, uh, I was in Australia. The, uh, you probably seen the movie Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a real guy named Crocodile Dundee. His name is Barry Lees. He's dead now. And I went down to a hunt with him, and I wanted a huge um, um, uh, buffalo, okay, uh, a huge water buffalo. And so uh, we went, and there was a certain area in the northern uh, Australia near uh, uh, Darwin. Uh, it had a pond, a little pond about as big as this room. And he says he should be there about sunset. Uh, we'll go over there, and when he's there, I'll throw some pebbles on him from that side of the pond, and he'll jump up. And he'll go this way because he can't, he can't get over this big log, he said. Anyway, a uh, man plans, God laughs. He threw the pebbles. The, the buffalo did exactly the opposite of what the fucking moron said he would do. <laughs> and he jumped out of the pond and he ran right over the top of me. And as he went over the top of me, I was hunting with the big pistol. I, just as one of his hoofs hit me here and one of his hoofs, uh, oh, excuse me, one of his hoofs hit me here and one of his hoofs hit me here. And as I fell down, I squeezed off and the bullet went through his chin, through his nose, Shit. but missed his brain. And so he's running off into the uh, jungle. So then I chased him down for about a kilometer, a kilometer <laughs> and a half. And uh, I'm firing at him as we're going along. And I, didn't, I couldn't tell if I was hitting him because he wasn't slowing down any. And so then um, all of a sudden he spins around just like in the movies. He goes like this and he charges. And I go just when he's about where that camera is, I pull the trigger again. It goes click. I'm empty. <laughs> and, and he falls dead at my feet, though. I'd hit him all four times. But what Barry Lees was screaming at me, you're out of ammo. You're out of ammo. Because the 454 console only has five shells, not six. Uh -huh. And we're used to hunting with a handgun. Normally, they have six. So you're used to the six shell. But, uh, the, um, so, but about that same time frame, I decided it was time for me to pack it in. I had uh, a couple of close calls. And I was still alive, so... Uh, still get the tail of the tail? Yeah, yeah, and so... Uh, Did you not get your buffalo on here? Yeah, yeah, I got buffalo. He's, you walk right the one underneath them. The one you killed? Yeah, the, the, you right, walk right underneath them in that oh, hall. Sick. The big hall, yeah. Two buffaloes, a cape buffalo and a water buffalo. How did, So, how did you... How do you have fun then? And to take your... Obviously, you need a break to take your mind off shit, and is that where you had your buzz and had your experience of life and living to go out hunting? That, that was, that's what I, uh, I thought at the time. Uh, I saw a lot of wealthy guys go hunting or climbing mountains and stuff like that. That was a thing then? Yeah, and, and so uh, it's not as much now. Of course, now with the per, uh, political correctness, uh, you know, it's, uh, nobody wants to kill anything. And, and I don't, uh, you know, uh, yeah. it's too easy to kill animals. I'd rather kill people. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a killer's way out, I think. It's, um, especially if you've got dogs as well, mm -hmm. I think. yeah. But then it was then thing again, product to your environment. Other people did that. If you surrounded with them, it, it became probably normal to you because you're not shy of injuries. You've had operations fucking everywhere in your body, knees, shoulders. Correct. But you did a lot of weight yep. training. Yeah, I used to be a big weightlifter, and the um, but uh, the um, I, I I I used what I used to warm up with now is what I lift now because I'm you know I'm about fifty percent weaker than I was at, back in my heyday. Uh, 20 some years ago. Um, but we have a gym here. We actually have two gyms. Sure enough. Uh, the, um, but um, the, the kids today find uh, reasons or they find things to do to really procrastinate to not, not take action. <clears throat> it's, uh, but you got to love, or you got to have a passion for what you do. If you don't, you know, um, it, it gets tired. Alistair Cook, the great presenter, BBC presenter, told me about, I don't know, 30, 35 years ago. Being a professional, being a high performance professional is being able to do your very best when you don't feel like it, mm -hmm. okay? When you don't, okay. And, uh, and, and I've had days, not every day uh, do I, I wanna speak uh, when I'm at the university, the Oxford University, Edinburgh, whatever, but they don't know it. Mm -hmm. As far as they're concerned, I look like, you know, I was, I was born for that night. Yeah. And, uh, the, uh, and so, but I was taught, high performance people don't leave anything on the stage. Yeah. yeah in athletic uh, endeavors, I never left anything on, on, uh, on the field. In uh, public speaking, uh, I don't leave anything on the stage. I'm fully spent yeah, at the end of each day. I think that's where you, your success comes in, though, because a lot of people, 
I'm, you're not motivated 24-7. You'll give me one or, day, one or two days a week where you're motivated. The rest, you need to fucking earn that. But that's the where you'll get your results. The days you can't be fucked doing anything. The days you can't be asked getting up at half four in the morning. Everybody's got a blueprint in their mind who they want to be, but they don't live up to it because of those... I think it was a, um, Andy Carnegie who did the... What's the Napoleon Hill book? Um... Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. We think he interviewed the, the top 40 most successful people in the world. I think it took him 20 years to do it, write the book. And success leaves clues. Those men were up at 4 a.m. Those men were putting in 20 hour shifts. And there's always, again, model image to realise that there's something that happens, but nobody does Well, that. you know, uh, taking off on what you just said, success leaves clues. If the high performance people that we've alluded to so far during this interview don't hang out, don't go to the Super Bowl. Uh, 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 work 15, 18 hour days. Uh, have no friends. I mean, what does it take? A sledgehammer to hit the kid in the head to understand that they're doing the antithesis of that. They're doing the abs uh, ab absolute opposite of that. And that's why their results are, are you know, are de minimis. They're, they're, they're not worth a, uh, a shit. And, uh, but the kids today, the uh, and what I believe the political correctness movement, which is a manifestation of lack of self-esteem. It's hard to find anybody with self-esteem, and it's doubly hard to find somebody with self-esteem that's got some balls. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's pretty uh, well uh, next to impossible. One of the reasons we started boxing at the seminars uh, <laughs> is that uh, some of the kids had never been hit, some of the kids had never been slapped, uh, and so the uh, to see the fear in their eyes. When they get ready to get up in the ring, it's quite remarkable. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that uh, you can be uh, 35 years old and never been in one confrontation in your whole fucking life. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it's just hide from the pain and try to live in a bubble where life's great and life's, life's fucking tough. There's it obstacles is. every single day. You have family members dying. I've lost family members through murder, suicide, overdose, but it's all part of the struggle and realizing that this is fucking life. This, do, I, do I lie down and die or do I accept it and move on to progress and realise I don't want to die the same as everybody else I want to leave a fucking legacy from a guy from somewhere like Govan <laughs> to be sitting sitting in a castle speaking to yourself again it's you've got to believe in yourself you've got to fucking work hard and get up at half four For does anybody when you do like put them into a boxing ring do they ever quit walk out Fuck this too. Oh, much. we've had we've had we've had a couple that were getting beat up so bad, not really beat up, beat up, uh, but beat up so bad that they just kind of uh, uh, cower in uh, up against the ropes. Uh, we, we've had, uh, um, but that but but about ninety percent of the kids get in the ring. Uh, the ten percent normally uh, it's because they uh, there's something wrong with them that they can't mm -hmm. can't affi get in. Uh, but we've had some, you know, we've had people knocked out. We've had to call uh, uh, 999 a couple of times. <laughs> uh, they had a lot of blood on the uh, floor of the ring. And uh, my goddamn uh, staff uh, scrubbed it all up. Uh -huh. I want to see the fucking blood. I don't want it scrubbed <laughs> up. God damn it. <laughs> how, how does that help them progress? It helps them because, it because them? when they're going to call on the, uh, the former chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, that's not hard. Getting punched in the fucking face is hard. Uh -huh. And if they can get punched in the face and call on the fucking Royal Bank of Scotland. Becomes easier. Correct. So, yeah, to toughen up, basically. Correct. Because we, we do live in a very soft generation. Everybody's weak. We spoke about it earlier, but you can't say a fucking joke without people getting offended. This is where, is this where the 98% are scared, weak, live Correct. in fear? Absolutely. We can't change it. There's no way that percentage is going to rise anytime soon because social media has fucked with people's mind. It's become the biggest addiction, I believe, on this planet. People are looking at a screen and looking at other people live their dreams and ambitions. And the majority of people who think they're living a great life aren't anyway because if you're living a great life, you don't need to fucking post about it. How do we change that mindset? What, what do you think things should be put in place in the schooling? Do away with yesterday? social media. Uh -huh. One of the things that I uh, require for the kids that come through the program is they sign off Facebook, close it down. Mm -hmm. How did it do? How did it do with that? Oh, well, I mean, uh, some of them are addicted to it. Yeah, yeah, but they do it, and mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden they have all kinds of free time because mm -hmm. it, it's uh, there was a study done by Gallup in you know, America, and I would assume it's a, roughly the same here that uh, forty percent of the time that your employees 
or have their computer on at work. They're not doing work. They're fucking around. Yeah, because I know on your seminar, in your seminars, you get people to be on a be on time, do their homework. Because if they're not, they're straight out the door. Correct. And have no to dress like this. Yeah, no the seminar. fucking about. First impressions. You always speak about it. Why is that so important to you? Because they, 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 you, when you're going in, and our system is based on not using your money because almost all the kids don't have any money, but using somebody else's money. And when you, the two biggest levers in life are other people and other people's money. If you're going to use somebody else's money and you walk in looking like a freak with earrings in your nose and tattoos on your face, <laughs> what, what, what kind of confidence is that instill? Uh -huh. So for you, what did you think? So for your, what drives you then? Is it, is it money or is it just the, the drive to succeed, keep progressing, keep no, setting goals? My drive now is to, when they put dirt on me someday, is to, uh, I'm already the most successful high performance wealth coach on the planet just by the fact of the numbers that we've produced. Uh, nobody else talks about numbers because nobody else produces numbers. N everybody else is afraid to keep track of the numbers because they're non-existent. Uh, we're really at 665 billion now. Uh, we, uh, the, uh, the, the $50 billion, if I, someday I have to go to court, one guy will come in and testify, I generated $56 billion under Dan's leadership. One guy, okay? We don't have to have more than one witness in that trial. One witness, okay? But we're really at $665 billion. Uh, and the, uh, 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 my, my goal is when I hit a trillion, I'll probably hang it up. Mm -hmm. I'll probably hang it up. That'll be F. And that's going to be sometime as soon as humanly possible. I don't know when. I'm not waiting until I'm 90. I'm not waiting until I'm 85. I'm not waiting until I'm 80, uh, but as soon as humanly possible. And the, um, but I, I want to go out uh, with the, the, the mantra of being uh, the, the greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. Well, you're fucking right yeah. on course. Yeah. Does that, so that's what drives you to be Correct. the best number one. Correct. Did you have the biggest deal in the planet, 500 billion? Yes, yes. That was um, NEOM, uh, the uh, joint venture between Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Egypt, and Jordan. Uh, it's a uh, 25,000 square kilometer uh, new city being built on Saudi Arabia's land. Uh, and, uh, was headed up by Dr. Klaus Kleinfeld, my mentee uh, of 20 years. And uh, that's the biggest deal. It is now, though, much more than that. The World Bank has committed $2.5 trillion dollars. Uh, the International Monetary Fund has cre uh, uh, donated uh, or committed 2.5 trillion, so that's five trillion dollars added onto the 500 million, so it's really five and a half trillion dollars. But I'm not going to call myself the five trillion dollar man. Uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> in fact, I I, I, I don't wear it today, but I have suits like a McGregor. It says 50 billion dollar man down the pinstripes. Yeah, you know? I fucking love it. Yeah, that. so um, the uh, I'll, I'll be the 50 billion dollar man until we hit a trillion. That's unbelievable, Dan. Do you ever feel accomplished? Do you ever feel satisfied? No, that, I'm that never satisfied. Never, nothing's ever enough. Uh -huh. Because the, I watched a lot of your videos because I knew you were coming on. And I love the way you... A lot of these people promote themselves as money, 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 money. But yourself, you're, you've, I've watched a couple of times and you says money's not everything. Which, it's not everything. Which I agree because... The, the, the money makes the world go round. We need money to do things. I do a lot of homeless stuff. So for me to be successful, the more money I generate, the more people I can help. So it becomes important to make money. People say, oh, you're working too hard. Why are you never sleeping? Why are you never out? Because I want to create something to leave a legacy to create change. And for me to create change, I need to make enough funds to start making these changes and put things in place. And you, you have said a lot, a, lot a, few, a few times that uh, money's not everything. It's not, it's not everything, but it's the only thing anybody keeps track of. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I tell the kids, you want to save the world? I'm not a save the world guy. I don't give a fuck the world ends, you know. <laughs> I don't give a shit it goes down the toilet. But, but if you want to save the world, go create a product or a service that changes a billion lives, like Zuckerberg and Facebook, okay? Uh, and then take that money that you make off that product or service, and then go change uh, the rainforest or whatever. Uh, the, but just carrying placards around embassies doesn't change anything. The, uh, the kids that want to save the world, uh, we teach, we coach, we mentor, that they have to create a, something that's worth uh, something to a billion people. And by definition, you get super wealthy and you'll be able to uh, make your uh, dent in changing the world. Uh, Warren Buffett uh, and uh, Bill Gates and those, that elk, 
they made tons of money before they started changing the world. Only in recent years have they tried to uh, change the world and, and stop, stop typhoid, stop malaria, uh, help the rainforest, uh, uh, reduce its de 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 uh, decreasing the rainforest. And, uh, but they've been super, super wealthy mm -hmm. a long, long time. See, I always think the world, will, when humans are long gone, I think the world will always reproduce itself. It will always grow into be the place it's going to be. Because you spoke about global warming, warming and you said it was a lot of shite. It is, well, yeah, uh, in my opinion, it's not global warming. It's uh, climate change. Okay. Now, there's only been 11 teams that have been to both the North and the South Pole since Amundsen discovered the, um, the South Pole in 1911. Only 11 teams. 11. 10 are dead. You're looking at half of one team. My wife and I are the 11th team that have been to both motherfucking poles with scientists. And all these cocksuckers are flapping their fucking lips about global warming. They've never been to the fucking poles, let alone both poles. Sally and I have stood on the motherfucking X that mm -hmm. points to the North Pole, Magnetic, and the South Pole. It is climate change. When the scientists told me in the South, uh, they're going, they've taken about 5,000 core samples, these tubes of ice. By the way, the South Pole's on a mountaintop. Not many people realize that. So you can suffer from uh, oxygen deprivation. And they're going through about 15 or 20 of these cores. And they said uh, 200,000 years ago, it was this temperature. And 55,000 years ago, it was two degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. I said, so wait, excuse me, doctor, stop. And uh, how can you be assured of that? And we're plus or minus one millionth of a percent or some crap like that. And then I said, what about global warming? All 11 of the scientists start laughing at the same time. Like, you know, a laugh that you try to get in a comedy store. Mm -hmm. eh, I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. Okay? <laughs> and he says, it's a load of shit. <laughs> Everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, in the last few years, the government has said how they made a mistake. It's, it's, it's climate change. And the, uh, the world's going to end in four and a half billion years anyway. Mm -hmm. Who gives a shit? Yeah. I think, but is that, the media has got a lot to do with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The fucking brainwash. It's everybody. just like uh, Trump, who now he's not a Russian uh, spy, but the, uh, do you listen to the news on CNN? He's still a Russian spy, mm -hmm. even though the, uh, the Mueller report came out and said he's not a Russian mm -hmm. spy. Because you're friends with Trump? Uh, not friends. I, I, full disclosure, I knew, I knew the president uh, 25 years ago. We were in the same, not social circles, but mm -hmm. we used the same lawyers. But I, uh, speaking of uh, President Trump, I've met five presidents. None of them in the White House. Almost everybody that meets the president's in the White House. Mm -hmm. But all the five presidents I've met have been uh, either social or work related. Uh, I've met none of them in the White House. But I knew President Trump before he was president. He's a fucking character. Oh, he, he's a hard ass. And the hardness and harshness he shows now, he's a thousand times harder than that. He's trying to be good. <laughs> he's, he's trying to, his best to be good. Uh -huh. Do you think men at that that caliber, including your own your, yourself, are are that fucking crazy that they don't? They're give hard. A, they don't give a fuck. I don't know anybody that has attained mammoth success that's not hard as fucking nails. Mark Zuckerberg looks quite soft though. Yeah, but it, well, he he's an introvert, uh, but he is hard. I mean, he's hard. Working wise, work yeah. ethic, yeah, belief system to create things that's changed the world. Yeah. If you get any, what's your plans for the future then for change or? Well, I mean, well, I'm going to continue to give the seminar. Um, there's no guarantee that, uh, you know, I'm only committed to this year. Uh, the, um, but I'll probably give the seminar a couple more years. I enjoy it, though. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's hard work when I'm up there for 10 hours. But, I mean, all I have to do is roll down from my master bedroom, down the hall, mm -hmm. down to the pavilion. So, I mean, it's not like i got to go anyplace. Yeah, because you do your seminars in the house. Correct. No, we do, yeah, in the pavilion. Yeah. There's a pavilion. Uh, uh, down about 150 meters from here. But uh, uh, two-thirds of my time is pro bono. I give it away. Uh, I speak at universities uh, for free. They don't pay me any honorarium. I go there on my own nickel. I speak. Um, the, uh, I had the privilege of speaking, and as I was talk, said earlier, about a year ago at the University of Edinburgh, I spoke at the United States Naval Academy a, a few weeks ago. Uh, the, uh, I speak uh, at uh, Worldwide universities. I don't have enough time to go to the university. So what I do is I plug in uh, with my other charitable work, my wife and I, so we can travel to a university to speak. Uh, I'm uh, 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 planned. I'm speaking on 
uh, September 12th, I believe it is, at the University of Pennsylvania, where uh, President Trump went to school. Uh, the, um, so I, I do a lot of stuff for veterans. Uh, uh, right now, uh, I'm working on a, a TV show um, and a book with William Morris, my agents. Uh, the, um, uh, so yeah, I, I keep busy. I mean, every single day I work. Uh, we just got back uh, yesterday from a 25-day road trip. Uh, living uh, in hotels uh, that went from here to Hawaii, to Los Angeles, to Ohio, to New York, to London, back to here, um, and the um, and it, it's just it's part of our life. It's you know it's our life cycle. Yeah, you put a lot of people in their twenties and thirties to shame, but your work ethic, but that clearly shows the results. Because the results don't come easy, but they speak for themselves that your work ethic is second to none. I've never heard anybody travel as much and work as much as you. And no disrespect for your age, but it puts a lot of people to fucking shame that that's embarrassing compared to some people. Is there any certain areas, like countries are where you go, they've got a great belief, they've got a great work ethic, they're not so soft, they listen and they educate themselves to better their life as a certain Well, country. New York City has the, the best work ethic in, on the planet. Mm -hmm. New York City. 24-7. Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, and that's why the famous song, you know, if you can make it in New York, you can make, make it, it anywhere. anywhere. Uh, there, uh, Los Angeles has much less uh, work ethic because uh, I think the sun bakes their brains too much, um, mm -hmm. always being sunny out there. Uh, the um, Hawaii's got a less of a work ethic. I just came from a wedding uh, there. Uh, the um, uh, London's got a pretty good work ethic, uh, but not like New York City. Uh, Russia has a tremendous work ethic because under communism, you worked or died. Mm -hmm. So they didn't give you any choice. Yeah. Uh, the, um, but it's, it's tough. We've had almost two full generations of laziness built in. And that laziness uh, uh, manifests itself into uh, uh, what we call political correctness. You know, Sometimes it's even considered impolite to work too much. You don't want to make your colleagues feel bad. Mm -hmm. So will you work in two extra hours makes them, well, I don't give a fuck if I make them feel mm -hmm. bad, okay? Uh, I think Amazon has got the best work model of any company uh, in the last 50 years. And uh, there was a great article in the New York Times a couple of years ago. The, the average minimum work hours at Amazon is 80 hours. 80 hours to keep your job, 85 hours a week to be considered for a promotion, 90 hours plus to get a promotion. And it's the fastest growing, uh, most uh, lucrative uh, business model that's been created in the last 20, 25 years. It, it was the largest market cap company in the world uh, a couple months ago. Now it's maybe the second or third. Uh, and they don't pay dividends. And that work ethic is not imposed by Jeff, the CEO, founder. It's imposed by the employees. If you want to get, go leave the, to, to go see your baby born, they shame you to come right back. <laughs> but again, if you there's a photo of the first office of Amazon, and it's like a four feet to eight feet room. It's fucking tiny yeah. to where it is now to believe in the self and to work on it and create mass changes because it's Amazon will be about forever. Well, how do you think that stuff like YouTube, Amazon, Google? Do you think it'll ever be bought out? It's too expensive. I think, think that I think they're too big. Uh, uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon uh, are just uh, are too huge. Um, I don't ever see uh, uh, Amazon acquiring Google or Google uh, uh, acquiring uh, Facebook. Uh, but um, those are three companies that you probably could bet a lot of money they're never going to be acquired. Doesn't mean they're they're they're, they're not great companies. I mean, the uh, huge. Uh, Twenty years ago, there was no Google. Mm -hmm. Or 50, I think 15 years ago, there was no Google. Just look yeah. at it now. Yeah, it's unbelievable how fast it's grown, but it's unbelievable also how 15 years can change your whole life as well. Just Correct. Just with work and belief. Who's the best president you ever met? Uh, president Nixon. Yeah, how come? He was presidential. He just, uh, I was a young army officer and I was a, a part of a security uh, uh, detail that was guarding him when he was uh, traveling to NATO in 19... Uh, 67, 68, uh, and the, uh, he just, he, he wanted to know your name, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying other presidents don't, uh, but I met, um, 
John Kennedy, as a young teenager working at the 1960 Democratic Convention at the L.A. Convention Center, I at that time thought I was a, uh, a moderate Democrat. I wasn't old enough to vote yet. I met him. Then I met Nixon when I was in the military uh, as a young Army officer. Uh, I met uh, George Bush I. Uh, he was a neighbor of mine in, uh, when I had a, a, a running a big company uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, then I met uh, President uh, Clinton when I was on the board of directors of the university. I went and there was a big earthquake that flattened it, and he and his wife came to visit the devastation of the earthquake, and I got to meet him. And then, of course, I knew Trump before he was president. Um, and the, um, uh, so uh, it's unusual that I've met five presidents, none of which are in the White House. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, but uh, the, uh, Nixon is uh, uh, truly, they're all the people I just mentioned are all gifted smart, mm -hmm. but uh, Nixon was, uh, he, he was probably, other than Bush one, was probably the, the best trained guy to become president. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had his eye on being president ever since he was a young lawyer. The uh, and it's it's the world, but it's a different place than 50 years ago. Believe me, yeah. I mean it's, it doesn't hardly resemble. Uh, the only thing that's probably the same as 50 years ago is Scotland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's going to be the same for the next 50 years. Yeah, I mean it's it, but it's a lovely. But I don't I don't want 10 million people living here. Mm -hmm. I, I I didn't come here to have neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. As it's stunning, the people are crazy. What, for yourself, Dan, what's good leadership skills? Because I know you are ruthless, but to be a true leader, you've got to lead by example. And Correct. I believe you do that. And do you put so much pressure on people where they fucking break? Or do you put enough on them where you're trying to build them up? No, you, you put them right up to the breaking point, then pull them back. Yeah. Okay. Um, people don't do what you tell them to do. They do what they see you do. If you're a leader that comes in at 6.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. even though the workday doesn't start till 8.30, the employees will probably come in at 7.30. Mm -hmm. If they see you working until 8 o'clock at night, even though the work day is over at 4.30 or 5, they may not stay till 8 o'clock at night, but they'll probably work till 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Uh, so they see, the same with raising kids. Kids don't do what you tell them to do. They do what they see their parents do. That's why so many kids uh, 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 are snowflakes because their parents were snowflakes. Mm -hmm. So leadership starts with you. Uh, and, uh, the, and, the, uh, and the examples you set, uh, but you have to lead by example. You have to work. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, know, I know guys that are wealthy that come to work at 11, go to lunch, go to the gym, and then go home. Mm -hmm. And they want to know why they're, they're, they're not uh, uh, as productive as they should be. But you have to um, keep your employees accountable. What gets measured gets accomplished, okay? When I'm in marketing and sales, we check results daily. Not weekly, not quarterly, mm -hmm. not monthly, daily. When I come into the sales room, I mean, I don't say, did we do any sales today? How many fucking sales did we do? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, because I came up sales, which is unusual, but I could pick up the fucking phone and I, who, what's this? Give me, give me two sentences on this prospect. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you, ma'am? This is Rufus Doofus calling from Glasgow. Oh, yeah, I know they call us Ouija's, but eh. And I, I show them how to sell myself. Mm -hmm. Because there's a great saying, it, it's um, a thousand sheep led by a lion will always beat a thousand lion led by a sheep. Correct. Saying with the leadership, you can make anybody feel this. You can make anybody believe that they're a warrior. You can make anybody believe that they can achieve anything. And that's where true leadership comes down. And I don't think there's enough role models for people to look up to and go, I want that. Because, again, it's a softened generation. Everybody's fucking weak. Everybody's scared to make moves. Everybody's scared to hurt people's feelings. And I get it. I, I try and make people laugh and feel good and love me as well. But there, there comes a time you've got to cut all ties. You've got to surgically remove those people who are weighing you down. Do you know what I mean? Well, well, when I give a talk at a school or a business, um, I spoke to Hyperloop uh, Group. Uh, Hyperloop is, a, is the thing that initiate, was initiated by Elon Musk about the tube that's gonna run under the ground, uh, is yeah. a fast uh, yeah. subway on the ground. Tunnels. Yeah, and I, I, and I say, uh, not just to them, but to everybody I speak to, if you like me at the end of my talk, I didn't do my job. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not here for you to like me. I'm not here to insult you, but I will. I, I, I'm not here to uh, criticize your race, your ethnicity, your religion, but I will. 
I'll do whatever it fucking takes to drag your sorry arse across the goal line. <laughs> Punch you, spit on you, slap you. It doesn't make a difference to me because I'm not here to make friends. If you want a fucking friend, buy a fucking dog. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to be your friend. <laughs> How many people are in your seminars, Dan? 24. How many a year do you do? Uh, this year we'll do 10. So I've done one for you. And I, don't do, I haven't done a seminar outside this estate, a seminar, since 1999. So everybody all over the world comes. Correct. What's your success rate for people? Do people... 100%. Yeah, no fucking about. They always learn something. 100%. Uh, a quarter of them uh, will become uh, multimillionaires. We had a kid here, an uneducated kid, uh, 45 years old. He doesn't like me telling this story. Uh, his benchmark for success, in other words, what's my return on investment going to be? That's not how I look at it, but that's... Just from the seminar. Seminar costs roughly $20,000, okay? He says, so, okay, so how many times am I gonna get my $20,000 back? I said, I don't know, it's up to you, kid. 10 months later, Sally and I are having a drink with him in New York City at the Lowell Hotel. He had just made 30 million in 10 months, dollars. About 20 million sterling, more or less. And Sally said, when he walked into the room, the bar, he kind of had a glow on him. And you know how Back to the Future, that skateboard that they float mm -hmm. on? His feet weren't even touching the fucking ground. I mean, I, it's an illusion. Mm -hmm. he, came, he had a smile this fucking wide, okay? He sat down and he says, well, thank you, thank you. And he said, I remember how you asked me? He says, yeah, I know it. I got a thousand times my money back. Because he gave 10 million to his people. That's not very Scottish. Mm -hmm. And he kept 20 million. Mm -hmm. Scott would keep 29 million at 900,000 <laughs> and give 100 grand to his staff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and, but uh, that happens all the time. And the, um, but he did. He followed the steps. He, you know, and well, it's, 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 it's quite remarkable. I'm following and copying, mimicking, modeling Andrew Carnegie's model. Mm -hmm. That's the model I use. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, he was using it 140 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's commercial debt driven, no equity involved, commercial debt, that means bank debt. Mm -hmm. Because the little mean Ouija, mean meaning cheap, mm -hmm. uh, not Ouija, Scott, uh, didn't like giving up uh, ownership in his deal. So he used commercial debt. Is that one of the reasons why you came to Scotland? Well, anyway, no, I didn't know I was gonna be a coach when I came to Scotland. Mm -hmm. I came to Scotland to be uh, near the home of golf. Mm -hmm. I used to be a fanatic, and I used to play St. Andrews and Carnoustie. Yeah, Carnoustie's just down the yeah, road. Yeah, yeah, I used to, I had a, a caddy at uh, the old course, and I had a caddy at Carnoustie. Mm -hmm. uh, I, used to, I, I used to be a psychopath. I don't think fuck all changed. No, 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 no I, I always do everything to excess. Uh -huh. I mean, the, um, yeah, but I, yeah, that's why I came here. I also came because I was concerned about kidnapping. Our kids were little, uh -huh. and, uh, and we, I was a high-profile person, and this, we had security, the former head of security uh, for the Royal Yacht Britannia for the Queen, was our head of security here, mm -hmm. uh, a retired uh, Royal Marine. Uh, and the, uh, and, and it, because this is a good place to defend. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of, there's a lot of open ground between, yeah. uh, around the castle. People with rifles hiding yeah. in the trees. Co correct, correct. It's, um, because when you listen to, uh, for people who don't know Andy Carnegie, was it steel he was involved in correct. America? One of the he men actually America. invented the steel industry. Yeah. Because if you listen to his videos in the 30s and 40s, it talks about the law of attraction as well, the mindset. Well, the, 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 you know, he's dead already. Yeah, but yeah. No, no, uh, but the, what you're listening to is Napoleon Hill's Napoleon about Hill. yeah. Andrew Carnegie. From, because Andrew uh, Carnegie he, died in 1919. Yeah, he's reading Andrew Carnegie's um, Correct. stuff. But it's about the law of attraction and the belief in what you think you attract. What's your opinion on the... I believe it, but... Too many people use it the opposite. Yeah. They attract because they're negative. They attract negative people. Mm -hmm. Okay, the the law of attraction is supposed to be you're positive, so you attract positive people. But remember, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. You're the average of the five, six, or seven people. And most people that are listening to this, not just this here, but most people around the world, the five or six or seven people. Would you like to be measured when you die by the five mates that you had? Another way of asking it. Would you like your kids? You have two kids. Yeah. Okay. Would you like your kids to grow up and be like your mates? No. No fucking way. Yeah. Would you like your kids to grow up, grow up and be like your parents? No. No fucking way. Mm -hmm. Would you like your kids to grow up 
not the, 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 you're kind of reformed now, mm -hmm. but would you like your kids to grow up and be like you used to be? Oh, fuck no, that. fucking way. No, even no. Okay, okay, okay. So I answer, I answer it. You know, uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. So and, and those are the kind of people you attract. Mm -hmm. And that's and, a great way, to, a great way to put it and be lead by example and be the vision who be the role model. I want my kids to be proud of me. I want to leave a fucking legacy, and it's I want to be people to be proud and make the changes that it can be done. People can change. When you see someone, Dan, do you know someone's got it or else they've not got it? Do you know? Uh, uh, yeah, 90% of the time I smell fear, uh -huh. I smell death, and I know the difference between uh, shite and reality, <laughs> okay? And uh, I can tell, if you, read, if you just read a, um, a uh, personal development book last month, I can tell you which book it is, was, because just because of the phrases and the nomenclature you mm -hmm. use, you're trying to utilize that you learned from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, I have, uh, I normally, the second slide of my seminars is a big um, a picture of Jurassic Park where they show dinosaur shit, a big pile of dinosaur mm -hmm. shit. It's about eight, nine feet high. This is what you've learned heretofore. Mm -hmm. Shite. <laughs> and I can't do anything from what happened before you walked in the door but today or this hour or this afternoon is the beginning of the rest of your life. And um, I still get, I got uh, an email last year from a guy I hadn't heard from since 2004, came to the seminar. He sent me his bank statement, approved, notarized by the vice chairman of the bank. He has 843 million cash in his accounts. I hadn't heard from him since 2004. Okay. Mm -hmm. He went to another part of the world and got involved in property development. So if he's got 840 million cash in the bank, I assume he's got other assets. Mm -hmm. So he's a billionaire oh, you know. that I never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, um, the uh, it's, I mean, right now we have the lowest interest rates in the last 5,000 years. Lowest interest rate. They're giving money away. Mm -hmm. Is that more... What's the rate in billionaires? Is it more frequent now to become a billionaire? Is people still struggling? No, it's still, there, there's more billionaires now. Yeah, is it how many have we got? Oh yeah, well, I, I think we've got over 2,000 billionaires now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, the, uh, I'm not saying it's easy. It's, it was never easy to be a billionaire, but now with internet money, as they call it, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's, it's more readily, uh, there are billionaires that work at Google that aren't the founders. Mm -hmm. There are billionaires that work at Facebook that aren't the founders. Yeah. There's billionaires that work at Microsoft that aren't the founders. See, when you first started making money, when did it start really snowballing for you? For one jump, say like a million to twenty million. Well, I remember. Jump? You know, well, it, 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 I, I explain that answer this way. I remember the first day that I made ten thousand dollars in a day, October nineteen seventy four. I remember the first day I made a hundred thousand dollars in a day. Uh, I remember the first day I made a million dollars in a day. I remember the first day I made ten million dollars in a day. And I remember like I brushed my teeth and took a shit this morning, <laughs> the day I made a hundred million pounds in a day. I mean, I still get chills when I say it. A mm -hmm. hundred million quid in a fucking day. It, 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 the best sex you ever fucking had, you can't even compare it to that. <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. There's not, nothing like a hundred million quid. That, the name of the book, your first hundred million. Mm hmm which is the name of my book, my old book. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, you know, it may not be, uh, money's not everything. Yeah. But there's a reason why it's the only thing anybody keeps track of. <laughs> That's very true. How can people get a hold of your books, Dan? Uh, well, no, my way, by the way, I give everything away free. Yeah. I don't sell anything. Yeah, do you yeah. not? No, don't, no. Yeah. That's very uh, unscottish. Very understand. noble of you. Yeah, well, uh, I don't, but 10 years ago, my product used to be the most expensive on, uh, online. Uh -huh. It used to be like $3,000 for a disc, you know, uh, uh, that cost me 20 cents to make. And then I finally, I got so tired of people uh, telling me, we can't afford your shite. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to give it all away free. And so we went from the most expensive to zero cost. And uh, all the stuff's on my website, danpena.co.uk, uh, uh, and it's free. Uh, we, have, we even have a uh, QLA for dummies. It's, it's basically for... Get your ass there. Yeah, no, no, it's basically for Ouija's. It's, it could be uh, QLA, QLA for Ouija's. We'll get that first day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the only thing I get paid for is this seminar uh -huh. that I give a few times a year. 
and the uh, you still got to value your worth, Dan. Yeah, you've got well, to value your worth. Yeah, and but the seminars are considered expensive. I don't consider them expensive, but mm -hmm. they're considered expensive. And uh, the but I've been giving away the product for ten years, and the uh, it's all the product is in. Uh, uh, we have a library, and uh, you know it's there's uh, I think there's sixteen megabytes or gigs, excuse me, sixteen gigs of free material, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, and it starts there, and the and uh, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all the people that have created money from my methodology, I've never met. Mm -hmm. Only the one hundredth of a percent have I met, and they're the ones that have come to the seminar. Do you get a kick from a buzz from people who's came to your cinema? Sen oh fuck cinema, yes, and yes, made oh. a billion. Oh yeah, I, I, I get, I get, a, I get, a, I get more than a cheap thrill. I really get excited. And then I've got four or five very successful mentees that are super wealthy in their own right. Um, that are uh, they, they're they're using QLA methodology to uh, do something else. One of the guys is a Chinese guy named Dan Loke, uh, who's a super wealthy guy. Uh, uh, Brian Rose of, Q uh, uh, of uh, London Real TV. Uh, yeah, he's a nice guy. Huh? The, yeah, uh, Brian. Uh, the, uh, uh, Jason Capital. Uh, 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 Michael Pillarcheck, to name a few, that are super successful. But what they've done, they've taken the methodology of making people accountable, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they put a softer spin on it. They're not as hard as I am. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not for everybody. We've had people quit the first day of the seminar. And we have no refunds. <laughs> but that's good. We've had people not even show up. <laughs> Don't watch these videos before you come there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's no refund. You know? I think that's a good thing because in this planet, nobody's going to like you. When I was a dick... Back in the day, people didn't like me, and now I'm doing good things. I, uh, More people I hate hear, me. I hear people still don't like you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm a bigger dick today, doing good things than I was when I was a dick. Now, being a, being a good guy in Glasgow is probably uh, uh, the antithesis. Uh, Glasgow is not known for the, the, um, the motherly love, and no, you know. It's tough. It's tough. For anybody watching, Dan, for anybody that's maybe trying to break through, and I know education, as knowledge can be power, what, what would... Would you advise them to read or research to maybe educate themselves about if people can't afford to come to one of your seminars? Start, go to my site, QLA for Dummies. Steph. Okay, <laughs> QLA for Dummies. It is a step-by-step -step pre, you know how, uh, let's say you're going to go to Sandhurst, but you're, you're not quite have good grades enough. They send you to a preschool before you go to Sandhurst or before you go to West Point or one of the big schools. They got a preschool, Okay. QLA for Dummies is the preschool <laughs> for uh, the QLA methodology, and it's been very, very successful. Also, take my tests. There's a 95% probability, I can tell you, you take the success test, the super success test, and the snowflake test, and I, I, uh, you can tell yourself, uh, just by the uh, results on the test, uh, whether you're going to have an easy road. There's no easy, but easier road to mm -hmm. success. Uh, but I mean, if you're not disciplined, you know, you have low self-esteem, you live with your mother and you're 33 years old, you're going to have a hard time. Mm -hmm. I was living with my mom just till last year, Dan. Okay. 34. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, but now you're not. No, no, I'm not. Now you're not. Now I'm spreading my wings and I'm, yeah, I'm focused. I'm focused. It's fucking hard. It's painful. But to get results and to do what nobody else has done in Scotland or Glasgow, I'm fucking going to do it. I'm going to blow everybody out of the water and it's cocky, confident, whatever it is, I'm doing it. I'm actions speak louder than words. I'm, I'm not um, quite there yet, but I will get there. Speaking of cocky, uh, in 1991, I got the award where I went to university, the most distinguished alumni in the history of the school. Okay. And so the TV are interviewing my father and the dean, the head of the School of Business. So they asked uh, Shirley Teeter, Dr. Teeter, you must, you've known Dan 25 years. What have you seen the change in him since he was a student here? Uh, she looks right in the camera. Now, this is a very devout, religious woman. Didn't wear makeup or anything like that. And she said, the only thing that's changed with Danny Pena is his mouth uh, uh, the, uh, have caught up with his, uh, uh, no, his accomplishments have caught up with his big fucking mouth. <laughs> now, this is a woman who had never, never said a bad word in her life. But she had so much venom and animosity stored up. Because I've been talking shit since I was... A kid. Boom. Yeah, yeah. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. You know, I've uh -huh. been talking that shit. Uh -huh. And then, you know, the uh, 
I either had to become the greatest or I had to go uh, uh, crawl in some hole someplace. Mm -hmm. And um, the, um, but I've, you know, I've always had self-esteem. Um, and the, uh, and it's it just something that, uh, and I'm thankful to my parents. Uh, they did a few things right. Uh, and that, that may be the only thing that they did right. Mm -hmm. um, but when my dad walked into this room through that arch right there, and I had my arm around him. He just says, just tell me it's not drugs. Because he thought the only thing that you could make this much money, mm -hmm. this quickly, had to be drug related. Because mm -hmm. my dad was a cop. Yeah, they broke his heart. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, like, my parents as well, a tough upbringing. It's not that I want to be better than them. I, I, I just want better for them. I want to create a life where I can give them a life and let them enjoy their, their years of being happy. And you said it before, it's not everything being happy, but it fucking helps as well to have money and to have stuff aside to create. To create even in Glasgow. To create, to even in Glasgow, there's... And now that you do say it, Glasgow is tough. People are cheeky and arrogant, but there's still a goodness in them. Everybody's got goodness in them. How did you deal... Before we finish up, Dan, how did you deal with jealousy? How did you deal with the naysayers and the hatred? Because when you become successful, I'm starting to see it and I'm nowhere near successful yet, but I'm getting so much negativity and... And a lot of people who are not living their own dreams and ambitions kind of, it shines a light on their life when you start doing something that they can. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Conrad Adenauer, the former mayor of Berlin, said, thick skin is a gift of God. Thick skin. I have thick skin. My wife says I have rhinoceros skin. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, uh, you can say whatever the fuck you want about me. Uh, you can't hurt my feelings. Uh, the, um, uh, I don't mind eating last as long as I eat most, uh, meaning that as long as I'm successful and uh, not just monetarily, but uh, through my success in my programs, I don't care what you say about me. Of course, now the people that's had nothing good to say about me, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago, uh, you know, you can't argue with success. The best revenge is success. Yes. The best revenge mm -hmm. for you uh, in a positive way is to be super more successful mm -hmm. than you are now. And, um, and then, you know, you're a brash, loudmouth kid, and then you'll be an eccentric, and then you'll be the grand old man of Glasgow. You know, the, <laughs> that's kind of, kind of how the transition Staying goes. in here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm moving to Guthrie Castle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you've also got a YouTube channel as well, Dan. Correct. Uh, Dan Pena. People check it out, check the videos. Uh, they're class. I was watching them last night, and I thrive on that, your energy, and the zero fucks given policy, and it makes sense to me. And for giving your time to... Uh, and bringing us in your home, it's been very much appreciated, well, it's, it's Dan. My and, pleasure. Yeah, and my wish, pleasure. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. And if you've got any free seminars for me and Steph, I'm sure we can come along <laughs> to one. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. Okay, Thank you're you. welcome.